So you just saw some political ads in that last commercial break. You're probably tired of the attack ads on your TV and on your social media. While campaign ads are as old as the republic itself, really the first moderate ad didn't start until 1964. Channel 2's Richard Elliott learned we see so many ads because they work, especially the negative ones. Six. It's called the Daisy Girl ad, and 56 years after it aired, it's still the most famous campaign ad of all time. Democratic President Lyndon Johnson used it to paint his Republican opponent Barry Goldwater as an extremist who was going to get the country into a nuclear war. These are the stakes. It was 1964 with the Daisy Girl spot by Lyndon Johnson against Barry Goldwater that really started uh, the avalanche. Uh, what we would call negative spots, negative ads. Just days from the election, we wanted to talk with Kennesaw State political science professor Dr. Kerwin Swint about campaign ads and what makes them so effective. Swint told me the Daisy Girl ad is really the first modern negative campaign ad. He spoke with the man who created it about why it was so effective. He said that television advertising, political advertising, is really about touching emotions in voters that are already there. You're not trying to convince them of something or, or send them a message. You're trying to connect with them on an emotional level. And that's what the Daisy Girl spot did. It connected with them as far as their emotional fear of the public, fear of nuclear war in that case. Negative ads are a very good way for candidates to define their opposition. UGA advertising and PR professor Joseph Watson points out that we see so many negative ads because they work. He also points out that those ads rarely come from the candidates themselves. They come from political action committees, groups that aren't supposed to have direct ties to campaigns. One was Willie Horton. Famously, for example, you know, the Willie Horton ad um, in, in the 1988 race that attacked uh, Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis was famously not a Bush campaign or, or a Republican campaign. It was it was a PAC it was a PAC ad that, that that particular ad. And many point to that ad as one reason Dukakis lost that race. It's morning again in America. There are, of course, memorable positive ads like Ronald Reagan's Morning in America, and ads that make you scratch your head like Herman Cain's Smoking Guy ad a few years back. And not all memorable ads come from professionals. WSB political consultant Bill Crane worked on Paul Coverdale's 1992 Senate campaign and says they got a random call one night from a woman in Cuthbert, Georgia, with an idea. This is essentially the message which she left on our answering machine. Let's put Paul Coverdale in the Senate and put Weisfowler out. White says, Prue, we don't need him in it, and Georgia wants him out. Crane credits that jingle by Margie Lott with helping Coverdale close a 22-point deficit and win that election. We never know when the lightning is going to strike and which ads are going to be the most impactful, memorable, and effective. But more often than not, the ones that are have humor, like the King Rat campaign, which was very effectively used by Sonny Perdue on the Internet. That 2002 ad portrayed Democratic Governor Roy Barnes as a giant rat stomping through downtown Atlanta. It never even aired on TV, only on the Internet. But one many experts believe helped Perdue win. And more recently, there was Brian Kemp's ad, Jake and the Shotgun. I'm Brian Kemp. This is Jake. My opinion is, from a strategy standpoint, that ad was, was genius uh, because it helped him accomplish a lot of goals all at once. Liberals were appalled at the controversial ad, but it wasn't aimed at them. The Kemp campaign used it to attract conservative voters, which it did, and many believe it helped him win the Republican nomination for governor. But there's a lot of pressure to do um, lower budget, quicker ads um, that are a little bit edgier now. Joseph Watson believes the future of political ads may be on social media where they can produce cheap ads quickly and hope one is good enough to go viral to get even more free exposure. So uh, the, the perfect campaign ad is a little 15-second TikTok video that goes viral and you don't pay anything for it. Correct. I mean, you do, we do a 30-second TikTok video or something like that. I mean, you know, that's the goal if you're in the campaign. I don't think they're there yet, but I think that that is the desire to get there because um, it's, it's inexpensive and efficient when it works, but it's not reliable. Channel 2's Richard Elliott joins us now. So, Richard, let's talk about the direction these political ads are taking. We see them popping up all the time, especially on social media. That's exactly right. There are really two reasons we're beginning to see a lot more of this on social media. One, those ads are a whole lot uh, cheaper to produce, which means they can uh, not put so much money in the production 
of the campaign ad. It goes instead to place the campaign ad by the airtime on social media. Also, on social media, you can actually target, you do a better job targeting your audience and tailoring that specific message. Let's say that uh, you have a candidate who wants to highlight his or her support of the Second Amendment. Well, then you can go into social media, find the people who like, say, the NRA or some gun manufacturers, and you can tailor the campaign ad just to those people. So another week of these ads, Richard, and then there could also be some runoff elections. So we might as well just get ready. Channel 2's Richard Elliott, thank you. And many political ads.